Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. Before we get into our study, I want to mention something I recently learned, and it's very disturbing. In a few podcasts, I have mentioned a made-for-TV series about the life of Christ called The Chosen. I know many of you are familiar with it. They have released two seasons of a planned seven-season series. For the most part, I have really liked them, at least up to this point. There have been a few things that I didn't like, such as the last episode where they made Jesus look like a rock star coming on stage to give the Sermon on the Mount. That was way over the top 21st century American culture forced into 1st century Jewish culture. A while ago, I heard that Dallas Jenkins had decided to use some Mormon facilities in Utah to film The Chosen, and that gave me some concern. But is a Mormon movie set any worse than a Hollywood set? The Mormon sets hold the potential for something very sinister and dangerous above that of using Hollywood sets that are known to be of the world. In an interview that Jenkins did roughly eight months ago with Morgan Jones, who is a Mormon podcaster, he clearly and boldly declared that Mormons are genuine brothers, sisters in Christ, and to quote Jenkins, that he would die upon that hill in their defense. In other words, Jenkins is claiming that they are an occult, but are part of what he considers the evangelical church. There are many legitimate sources on what I'm sharing with you if you question what I'm saying. Jenkins stated that he isn't Mormon but strongly asserted that LDS, or Latter-day Saints as they prefer to be called, are genuine Christians. Yet their doctrine is absolutely hostile to the biblical faith and contains some of the strangest and perverted doctrines out of all the growing list of cults. This is a gross error and deception on the part of Jenkins, because Mormons are a cult. Their Jesus isn't the Jesus of the true church, no matter what LDS claims or Jenkins asserts. Mormon podcaster Morgan Jones said in the interview with him, I have been told that you are a fierce defender of the Latter-day Saints' belief in Jesus Christ. And that is something that, honestly, on behalf of all of us, I just want to say thank you for that. But why is it that you are a defender of our belief in Jesus Christ? Did you hear what I just read? That's an exact quote. According to Mormonism, Jesus is the brother of Satan. He isn't part of the Trinity because they reject the Trinity, and he isn't divine like biblical Christianity proclaims. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of major doctrinal differences between biblical Christianity and the cult LDS. The Mormon Jesus is a radically different Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible, and any honest investigation into this will prove this to be the case. Jenkins is promoting Mormonism and their grossly perverted Jesus, and this is a very, very dangerous thing to do, and its implications are far-reaching. Over many years, LDS has been trying to clean up their cultish image of false doctrines and their embracing polygamy, which many of their sects still practice. They haven't repented of their heresies, but only strove to become more deceptive in promoting them. Mormons have been changing their language to make them sound more like born-again followers of Jesus, but they aren't. Though they have changed their language, they didn't change their definitions or doctrine. They are still a cult that sends people to hell over their heresies. I brought this out because I can no longer promote or sanction their series. To this point, Jenkins hasn't officially promoted LDS on his series, but there are serious dangers that need to be understood. If unbelievers and new or weak believers watch one of their shows and saw that LDS is funding and supporting that endeavor, they may go to a Mormon church and end up in hell over their heretical beliefs. This isn't a small issue. This series has gone all over the world and are influencing other nations. The potential for deception is all the more real because it can do tremendous damage and be a means for hell to keep people from coming to the biblical Jesus. If you want to understand the gross errors and dangers of the Mormon church, then get your hands on some good Christian books on apologetics, which is the defense of the true gospel. Their Book of Mormon is raw heresy, and that's what really defines this cult, not the Bible. Jesus warned us that there would be false prophets and false Christs in the last days, and we are in the last days. 
Why are we shocked that this is going on today and that a popular TV series could be a vehicle to introduce damnable heresies into the church and world at large? Though to this point in the series I haven't seen any doctrinal errors, the potential for that to come out in the future is real because of Jenkins' affinity with LDS. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. One of the strange and dangerous dynamics with cults is that they claim to have a truth that the rest of the church doesn't have. This is a type of Gnosticism where only certain people are allowed to know this secret knowledge. Cults portray themselves as the bearers of truth that they receive through special revelation while everyone else is blind. If you learn how the Book of Mormon came into existence, you'll either laugh at its obvious lies that produce such a heretical book or weep over how deceived the people are, including Jenkins. I am sorry that I had to bring this issue up and give a serious warning over what Jenkins is doing, but to be silent on the matter could cost some people an eternity in hell. In 2 Peter 2, verse 1, we are told, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Jenkins has secretly opened the door for Mormonism to get into the evangelical church, but their doctrine comes from devils. Now, if Jenkins is a fierce defender of the Latter-day Saints' belief in Jesus Christ, and their Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible, then Jenkins has become a false prophet that's secretly bringing damnable heresies into the church. There's so much more that I could say in the defense of the true gospel and to expose the deceptive doctrines that are creeping into the evangelical church. Sola Scriptura will forever be true. That Scripture alone is to define our faith, never another book that claims divine inspiration like the Book of Mormon. I've said enough on this subject, so now let's get into our lesson. As Jesus' popularity grew, so did the number of His disciples. He was very purposeful in making disciples, and as their commitment grew, so did His effort to develop them in truth, character, and leadership. Capability and leadership potential played into how much he invested into his disciples, at least to a certain degree. Yet Jesus was looking for those who had a passion for God. Because some people are born leaders doesn't mean that they make good disciples or even good spiritual leaders. So the character of a person is of tremendous importance. There are three basic categories of disciples. First, there are those who become his followers, and this is the largest group. Then there are those who had leadership abilities, a passion for God, and a teachable spirit, and these became the twelve apostles. Of the twelve, there was one that was a traitor, so in reality there were only eleven apostles, though Judas shared in everything that the other apostles did until he let Satan enter into him. Then out of the twelve, there were his inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. Discipleship is all about a teacher reproducing himself in the lives of his students, And Jesus was a master at this, and the Gospels clearly reveal this. At the beginning of Christ's ministry, he was gathering disciples and teaching them the truths of the kingdom of God. After a time, he chose from among his disciples the most devoted and discipled them in a deeper way, eventually raising up and distinguishing them as apostles. He narrowed this group down to three, who became his inner circle that he invested even more into so that the early church would have strong, faithful leadership to disciple others in like manner. After a necessary season of discipleship, it was time for Jesus to send them out on a short-term mission trip to practice what they had been taught. This brings us to the ninth chapter of Luke, where Jesus sent out the twelve to preach the good news, heal the sick and disease, and cast out demons. But their training couldn't produce the desired results unless they were given power and authority by Jesus to accomplish the mission. In our last lesson, we studied the first three verses of chapter 9, and I would like to read them so that we can see what's going on. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. I think there are two major reasons why Jesus instructed them to take nothing for the journey. The first was to prove to them that the Lord would provide for their needs when they were obeying His will, 
and the second was to instill in them his heart for ministry, which was to minister free from any ulterior motives. His command to take nothing for the journey wasn't the exclusive standard for the ministry throughout the church age, but the spirit and mindset of this thought should define every true minister of the gospel. The fact that Jesus made the point in Matthew that the worker is worth his keep teaches us that it's right for the church to financially take care of her ministers who are laboring full-time for the gospel's sake. The motive for ministry must be simple and pure, in that it's done for the glory of God, for the building up of Christ's church, through purposeful discipleship, and for the salvation of the lost. Any other motive for doing ministry will corrupt the ministry and minister and disgrace Christ before a watching world. Why did Jesus want signs and wonders to follow the apostles? Because signs and wonders give clout to what they preached. Many, and maybe even most of the people they ministered to, would have rejected the message they preached if it weren't for the miracles that gave them a divine stamp of approval. These miracles would open up many people to the message the apostles preached. Signs and wonders Christianity is the biblical faith. And there's absolutely no biblical evidence that the power and authority to perform miracles through the Holy Spirit was ever taken from the church. The same Holy Spirit is with us today, as He was with the primitive church. The problem we have today with not seeing signs and wonders as God would want has nothing to do with God Himself, but with erroneous doctrine and persistent unbelief. Now let's pick up with verse 4, where Jesus gave the apostles some more instructions about what he wanted them to do during their short-term mission trip. He said, Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. Matthew's account of this event adds an important dynamic. This comes from Matthew chapter 10, verse 11. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. The idea of people being worthy refers to those who either embrace the good news or are open to it. This would come out of their time of ministering in whatever village or town that they were in and received a friendly greeting from one of the residents. Hospitality was very important in that day since there weren't many inns for travelers to stay in. The people who took the apostles into their home would need to have the means to feed them and a place to put them up, so there was a small expense and inconvenience on their part. The apostles went out two by two, so the hosts would only have to supply the need for two people for however many days they stayed in that town or village. The point that they were to remain at the home they entered until they left the town was about not disgracing the host. Every home would have its challenges depending upon their financial status, the size of the house, the number of children, and the moral and spiritual condition of the people. Some of the homes they stayed in would have had some real challenges and inconveniences, but the apostles were to see the family as an opportunity to minister the good news. Their staying in people's houses would also reveal the lives of the messengers and how they handled themselves before the family who would have been closely watching them to see if what they preached they really lived. Evangelism not only includes what's preached, but the life that's lived out who does the preaching, teaching, or witnessing. Our lives might be the only Bible many people read, so we must make sure that our lives are a good and faithful epistle of the gospel. Jesus wanted the apostles to have the same mission as he did, which is to seek and to save who are lost. They were to purposely seek out those who were receptive to the message and then minister to them in an effort to make them disciples of Christ. Witnessing is a vitally important part of spreading the good news. But staying with people for a time would be a means of investing in the family the truths of the gospel so that they could become genuine followers of Jesus and get some strong roots to withstand any trials or persecution. In Luke chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus went on to say, If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. Matthew adds, As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. God's people are given the great privilege, responsibility, and obligation to share the good news with a lost and dying world. Those that hear the gospel but reject it are accountable to God for what they do with the truth that was given to them. If the messengers of the gospel find welcome from the people or a family, then they are to give it their greeting or blessing upon the house and family. 
Instead of greeting, the King James says salute it, and a few translations read, give it your peace. The idea is that as messengers or ambassadors of Christ, we go through His authority and commission, and when His ambassadors are rejected, they are rejecting the King that sent them. When Christ's ambassadors are welcomed by people, families, or communities, then the people have welcomed Jesus and He will bless them through His ministers. In this way, the peace the Lord has bestowed upon His ambassadors will flow through them to the people or family. God honors this by either giving or withholding His peace according to how people respond to the message and minister of the gospel. If after they have been welcomed into a home, but the people reject the good news and its messengers, then the peace they brought into that home will be taken away when they leave. The same is true for cities, towns, villages, and even nations. Those that reject Christ's servants reject the Lord Himself. And in Matthew's version of the sending out of the twelve, we are told that it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that man, woman, family, or city. It's a very serious crime to reject God's messengers, and even worse, to persecute and kill them. He will repay them according to what their sin deserves, and that's a terrifying thought. To shake the dust off their feet when people reject the gospel is a prophetic act that warns them of coming judgment for their crimes against God. To shake the dust off their feet was also a prophetic act of mercy, where some people might be moved to repent of their wickedness over fear of their coming judgment. Notice that it was Jesus who gave this command, not the church or apostles. Yet in our wimpy church culture that only wants a positive, happy message, they have rejected what Jesus commanded His messengers to say and do. An example of this is in how people can quote John 3.16 that speaks about the manifestation of God's love to the world in sending Jesus while failing to preach the next two verses. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. To withhold the full gospel is to keep from people the truths that God said was necessary for us to be saved and to live the victorious Christian life. Cults come into existence because they reject those non-negotiable truths that are integral to people being authentically saved. In verse 6 we see what the apostles did. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. One obvious point of this verse is that they obeyed Christ's command. As a result, the Lord rewarded their obedience with divine power and authority to preach the gospel, cast out devils, and heal people. Obedience is an irreplaceable part of the biblical faith, and nothing is able to take its place. Either we obey or rebel. There's no middle ground or option for us to negotiate terms of discipleship with God. When we obey, God's blessings are sure to follow at the proper time, and if we disobey, then we are sure to have consequences that we may regret throughout eternity. The picture here is beautiful. When the apostles obeyed Christ's commands, they were wonderfully used by Him. May we learn from their example and put this into practice. Moving on to the next section of Luke's Gospel, we come to verses 7-9 through of the ninth chapter. It seems like Luke inserted this information into the text because it doesn't flow with what's before or after it. The doctor wrote, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed, because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and so others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. It was Herod's responsibility to know what was going on in the portion of Israel that he ruled. Otherwise, Rome would have removed him if they thought he was incompetent. Our Lord's ministry had grown to the point that the political and religious powers in Israel were starting to pay close attention to him and to determine if he was a threat to the peace of the nation. Herod began hearing reports about Jesus, and in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 14, he said this to his attendants. This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Cusa, who was Herod's chief steward, probably had some of the best knowledge about Jesus and his ministry since his wife was one of his followers and even helped support his ministry. What Cusa would have said surely wouldn't have been the superstitious nonsense that Herod was told and ultimately believed. From this we can see that Herod had a superstitious element to him. 
Part of his fear must have come from a guilty conscience over having killed John the Baptist, besides all the other evils that he committed. Herod was intrigued with what he had heard about Jesus to such an extent that he wanted to see him, not to become one of his disciples, but as a curiosity seeker and to make sure that Jesus wasn't dangerous to his rule. The point that he was perplexed presents the idea that he didn't know what to do like a traveler who is brought to a tangle of roads going in many different directions and doesn't know which road to take that will bring him to his desired destination. Herod did eventually see Jesus, but not in the way he had hoped. We are told in Luke chapter 23 verse 8, When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. A selfish, evil man makes a selfish, evil ruler who is filled with self-interest in whatever he does, even as it relates to Jesus. The next event in Luke's account happens after the apostles return from their short-term missions trip, and this happened after Herod murdered John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, we are told that when Jesus heard what had happened in relation to John's death, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Taking a boat would have been faster than walking, yet the people followed Jesus on foot, which shows how popular he had become. In verse 10, Dr. Luke gives us some more information on the situation. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. The small village of Bethsaida was in the desert north of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus chose this solitary place to get away from the large crowds and to avoid Herod arresting him. Capernaum wasn't a long way from Bethsaida, so people seeking after Jesus could have walked there. Dr. Luke didn't record what the apostles said to Jesus or his response to them from their time of preaching and seeing the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit working through them. In the next chapter, we will see that Jesus sends out 72 disciples, and when they returned from that time of ministry, Dr. Luke did chronicle what they said to Jesus and his response to them. We will study that when we get to that portion of Scripture. The apostles reported to Jesus what happened, and I don't doubt in the least that he did some teaching in response. Part of the reason why he took the disciples away was to have a time of personal teaching with them. Jesus may have sent out the twelve to be an example to the other disciples that he will send out afterwards. In verse 11, we see that the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. We get from this a glimpse of how flexible Jesus was to minister in whatever situation he found himself in. He took the disciples away to impart to them some of the truths of the kingdom of God that he couldn't speak to the multitudes that came to see him, for they weren't ready to bear such truth. Yet when the seeking and searching crowd found Jesus, he rose to the occasion to teach them and heal their bodies. Since the people had followed Jesus of Bethsaida, there weren't any villages nearby to get food and shelter, especially for the large crowd that had gathered. Verse 12 gives us this information. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. This verse causes me to think that this was a divine setup, where Jesus not only went to such a remote place to teach the disciples, but to cause the people to follow him to a place where there wasn't any food or shelter. This way he could supernaturally feed the people, which gives them further evidence of his divinity by creating food for all the people to eat. The apostles were showing some wisdom and leadership capabilities, but from a natural standpoint, and this is all too common today. The divine setup is further revealed in verse 13 where Jesus replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. Jesus knew their answer before he asked them the question. The spiritual application here is very profound. The apostles had nothing to give but five loaves of bread and two fish, and what would that do for such a great crowd? We have nothing of ourselves to give other people that will benefit their souls and help them to enter the kingdom of God. The sooner we learn this lesson, the sooner we can look to Jesus to multiply the little we have so that we can give what's needed to those who are seeking after Jesus. Yet even in this, God won't multiply what comes out of the flesh life, but only what comes out of the Holy Spirit that lives within all true believers. 
What God gives us through divine grace and we apply to our life, He can take and multiply even more when we yield that back to Him. Self-sufficiency is self-trust and is an expression of self-idolatry. This is a killer of spiritual life because it grieves the Holy Spirit so that the power of Pentecost can't flow through us. Dependency upon Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit is absolutely necessary to have God-given results. Talented people can grow congregations without Christ and without the move of the Holy Spirit, but they can't grow Christ's kingdom without the blessings of the Holy Spirit moving through His people. Just look at cults and world religions, all of which are built through the wisdom of men and the inspiration of demons. Growth doesn't mean God is blessing a work, such as in the case with cults and world religions. Christ's kingdom can only be built through the work of the Holy Spirit, and this is a lesson we need to get burned into our heart and mind. In verse 14 we are told, About 5,000 men were there, but he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50. The actual number of people present we aren't given, since it was the manner of writing back then only to count the men and not women and children. This means that the crowd could have been upwards of 20,000 people, and there's no way a multitude like that could get enough food from the nearest villages to feed them. Jesus wouldn't have gone into the desert to have many of the people die in the wilderness from hunger. Jesus had a plan from the beginning, so he wasn't taken by surprise when this mass of humanity came seeking after him. Since it was the apostles that made the suggestion to Jesus to send the people off, he was going to stretch their faith by making them be agents which his miracle would take place through. Here is another wonderful lesson that we can learn from this account. Though the supernatural supply comes from God, He is looking for faithful messengers to be the agents or ambassadors by which His miracles can take place. Imagine if the apostles told Jesus that the days of such miracles ended with Moses when Israel was fed in the desert with manna. Either the miracle wouldn't have happened or the Lord would have raised up others that would obey His will and command. Jesus wasn't telling the apostles to perform miracles out of their own ability because that is absolutely impossible. He was commanding them to obey Him so that He might show forth His power through them. In verse 15, the disciples did so, and everybody sat down. It appears since the crowd was so big that Christ's disciples were commissioned along with the twelve to help the people sit down in groups of fifty. The way for the miracle was being set through their obedience to Christ's command. Verse 16 presents the miracle. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, He gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. Jesus gave thanks to the Father for the meal in typical Jewish style. Jesus didn't ask the Father to multiply the loaves and fish because he would use his infinite power to perform that miracle. Here again the disciples are needed to disperse the miraculous food to the people. The people would have received fresh bread and fish, not that which is stale or old. This may have been some of the best bread and fish the people ever ate in their entire life. I take it that the people would have gathered wood to cook the feast, but what a feast that must have been. For the miracle to take place, the disciples had to begin to walk among the people and be agents for the Lord to work through. Jesus could have done this without their help, but that's not how the Lord normally works. We are to be an integral part of Christ performing miracles here on earth. If we fail through unbelief or bad doctrine to be used by God to distribute His miracles, then we are the ones to blame for not seeing the supernatural take place. We are then told in verse 17, They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces that were left over. What a phenomenal picture! All the people were satisfied because they ate the food that Jesus gave them. Jesus wants to meet our true and deepest needs. But we must eat what He gives us, and according to the Gospel of John, Jesus preached a message after this event on His being the bread of life. Jesus is Himself the heavenly food we need to eat, and He gives us Himself for that very purpose. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 55, For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. This is spiritual food that gives spiritual life that's eternal. This has nothing to do with communion but with consuming Christ and being consumed by Him, where we find His life consuming our old sinful life and giving us new life in Christ that will last throughout eternity. Jesus is worth the pursuit. 
Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill.